Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And today we're back to the Cat Who books. And I don't think I'll ever be getting rid of this particular cat picture because I really, really like it. So, uh, this week's Cat Who book is The Cat Who Sniffed Glue. Um, as per usual, the title is in reference to something Coco does during the course of the book, um, but is not necessarily directly pertinent to the plot. Uh, so this book stands as a little bit different than the others because, for whatever reason, uh, Lillian Jackson Braun in this one decided that she was going to, uh, set the format such that the each chapter, each section of the book is described as if it were a play. So the prologue um, is actually fairly short, so I will read it to you. Yes, there really is a place called Moose County, 400 miles north of everywhere. The county seat is Pickaxe City, population 3,000. There really is a busboy named Derek Cuddlebrink, and there is a barkeeper who looks like a bear and charges a nickel for a paper napkin, and there is a cat named Calico Kung who is smarter than people. If they sound like characters in a play, that's because all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. So dim the lights, raise the curtains, she opens. And she calls the first half of the book Act One, the second half is Act Two, and Chapter One is not labeled as Chapter 1, it's labeled as Scene 1. Place, a bachelor apartment in Pickaxe City. Time, early one morning in late May. Cast, Jim Quillerin, former journalist, former journalist, now heir to the Klingon show and fortune, a big man about 50 with graying hair, bushy mustache, and doleful expression. Cal Ko Kung, a Siamese cat familiar, familiarly known as Coco, Yum Yum, another Siamese cat, Coco's constant companion, Andrew Brody, Pickaxe chief of police. Um, this is, is, other than this particular setting, this book becomes really quite typical of the series as a whole ongoing. You have the usual cast of characters, Andrew Brody, the police chief, uh, Fran Brody, Francesca Brody, uh, Andrew Brody's daughter, who occasionally hits on Quillerin, at least for a while, uh, Polly Duncan, who was Quillerin's, um, paramour, uh, the Landspeaks, who run the local, uh, who, who run a, uh, a local, uh, general store, Susan X. Bridge. Um, these, these are all various people who show up. Um, Pixie Rice. <laughs> these are all the people who show up throughout the rest of the series. Some of them show up in some books and not in others, but this is... This book is the general cast ongoing. Um, and so... What's in, and so the thing about this book is, in a lot of ways, it's unremarkable because it this fits into the series in a way that the first two seasons of Star Trek fit together, or the latter seasons of Star Trek Next Generation fit together, or is so many other episodic shows and books fit together, and that is that, in a lot of ways, this series, after this point, many of the books become genuinely interchangeable temporally. Um, you will occasionally find landmark points at which something happens and somebody will no longer be in the series, or, uh, Quillerin will have moved his home from one place to another, but... Other than that, the actual action of the books, at this point, the series becomes very, very much um, uh, existing at any point in time during the course of the series. So, the plotline of this one, um, after a beginning of the book during which Andrew Brody 
uh, confronts Quillerin, demanding that Quillerin basically uh, use Coco to help the police force in pickaxe solve crimes because Lieutenant Haynes from uh, down below, uh, back when Quillerin was working on the fluxion, uh, Lieutenant Haynes was aware that Coco had helped Quillerin solve crimes by doing things like pushing books off of shelves. And he told Brody about this when Brody was, it was, uh, south of the 400 miles north of everywhere. Uh, and, and so Brody shows up relatively early in the morning to harass Quillerin about Coco, and Quillerin basically says, Really? You expect me to order my cat to help you solve crimes? In any event, uh, so... The story, the murder in this one, is, uh, relatively straightforward, and more than that, um, I, and, and more than that, the, uh, the motivation behind it is also eminently straightforward. Quillerin goes through a whole review at the end, but basically it's, uh, you have twins, one of whom married the other one's girl, and so... Uh, the twin who who lost the girl and the girl get together to murder the first twin and and uh, you know it's because they want to be together and also because they want to get a large amount of money and so they do it and um, it's you know it's it's horrifying for the fact that uh, Harley and Jill murdered Harley's twin brother David and murdered Harley's wife that Harley had just married to spite both David and Jill by marrying be marrying her because somehow marrying somebody will spite your brother I don't I, the logic is not necessarily totally there um and in this book we meet Eddington Smith who is a lovely man and runs a used bookstore and is an expert in providing classical quotations, which by the end of the book he actually admits the only reason he knows all of them is because he took some very wise advice one time and memorized a book of quotations. Um, and so uh, the bulk of the reason that this book is organized as a play is because this starts off with Quillerin having joined up with the local thespian society. Um, if anybody's wondering, by the by, about the cover of this book, um, this is another book that I got from, that was purchased from a library used book sale, because if you didn't know a lot of libraries when they uh, decide that the book has been used enough or overused or should be replaced or just plain gotten rid of will very frequently put books on sale. Um, at the time, books were selling for as cheap as a quarter a book. And no, that does not age me. This was as recently as, uh, ooh, probably the 1990s. Um, although I suppose if you're one of those people born in the late 90s or early 2000s, assuming anyone that young is actually listening to this, um, that wouldn't seem recent, but, uh, in any event, so, uh, what happens is Quillerin has joined the, the local theater society, and, uh, it, and, uh, it sort of frames the first couple chapters of the book, that is Quillerin interacting with the Landspeaks who were in the theater society and uh, David and Harley Fitch uh, who are in the theater society. Harley being uh, the twin who murdered, being the murdering twin and David being the murdered twin. Um, and so that sort of frames the rest of this. Uh, and in fact, after the, uh, after the book is over and Quillerin, as always, yells at Coco for not being clearer in his 
extremely subtle hints, such as, Was it a coincidence you and Yum Yum started acting like bookends? Or were you pointing a paw at the twins? And, of course, Coco never answers because he is a cat, and even if he could talk, he wouldn't deign to answer some some human who isn't fortunate enough to actually be a cat. Uh, and the book ends with the epilogue that the prosecutor is seeking a change of venue for the trial of Harley and Jill, arguing it will be impossible to seat an objective jury in Moose County where the citizenry is still under the spell of the Fitch mystique. And, uh, the Klingon show and theater, I say skipping a couple of paragraphs, will open with an original review written by Quilleran and Hixie Rice. The hit number is sure to be I Left My Heart in Pickaxe City. Coco is learning how to turn the television off. So, this, uh, this book is very much framed by the theater. This is also the book in which we get the naming of the Moose County newspaper. Um, if you'll recall, uh, in previous books, we learned about the Pickaxe Picayune, which was the newspaper that hadn't changed since 1901, and that after the death of Junior Goodwinter's father, um, Quillerin basically uh, tried to get a newspaper sponsored up there that would be a real and proper newspaper, and eventually uh, the Klingon Show and Fund, colloquially known as the K-Fund, wound up sponsoring the newspaper. And so we get that first day when Arch Riker is, has come up there to be managing editor, and everybody's trying to put together their first issue, and uh, Quillerin winds up having a bit of a tiff with Polly Duncan, um, mostly over, uh, she's jealous of, uh, him going out to meals with other women, even though he really seems eminently devoted to her, she still has jealous fits, and they get into a tiff about the fact that he has decided to give up on writing a book, him because he's got a desk full of notes and no actual book written, and so he thinks he should write some sort of a something for the new paper, and uh, Polly Duncan thinks that he should knuckle down and write a book because he has so much potential going to waste, and they have a fight over it, and by the end of the book they reconcile their differences. But uh, that newspaper that Quillerin is in future for the rest of this series, going to be writing a weekly column for, uh, they can't think of a name. And so they've thrown around a few ideas for names of various kinds, the Moose County Clarion or, or uh, any, number of, uh, any number of other possibilities. And, uh, what happens is that, uh, Hixie Rice winds up suggest that rather Quillerin winds up suggesting put a bull put a ballot on page one. Just let everybody vote for what they think would be it. Um, this is, of course, after they've had the, the, uh, back and forth argument about whether it should be the Moose County Chronicle or Clarion or Crier or Caucus. We've got to make a decision fast. You newspaper types have no imagination, Hixie objected. Why not the most county cannonball or crowbar or corkscrew? And so, since nobody can decide, and uh, they put up a, a flag for the first issue, that Hixie says, call it the most county something. And so they, they title the newspaper the most county something, with the intention of there being a balloted vote for whatever they'll call it for real. And lo and behold, by the end of this book, the decision has been made by the people. The people have voted to call their local newspaper the Moose County something. Uh, Quillerin is somewhat amused, and Arch Riker is nonplussed and a little disappointed because he'll have to tell everybody back home and uh, parts further south that he is the managing editor of the Moose County something. Which is where I will end, because 
That's the ongoing theme of the series.